Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For today's episode, I conducted an interview with a guy who built a B2B media empire. When we talk about the media industry, we're usually discussing publishers that are geared toward a broad audience, outlets like the New York Times or CNN or NPR. Even more niche publications like The Verge or Bon Appetit are designed to attract tens of millions of readers each month. But there's also an entire ecosystem of business-oriented publishers that operate in extremely narrow niches, outlets aimed at sewage workers, electricians, and grocery store executives. Though their readerships are relatively small, they represent industries that collectively generate hundreds of billions of dollars each year. Because of this, B2B niche publishers, when run well, can be immensely profitable. Industry Dive is one such B2B publisher. Founded in 2012, the company now produces publications that cover over a dozen industries. I sat down with one of its co-founders, Sean Griffey, to talk about Industry Dive's origin story and how it bootstrapped its way to north of $22 million in annual revenue. Before we dive into the interview, I want to ask you a quick question. Has listening to this podcast helped you with your job? Every week I receive emails from listeners who work in the content business, and they tell me all the time that they're able to leverage insights gleaned from this podcast in their work. If you receive any value from my content, I'd like to ask your help in funding it. If you become a paid subscriber to my newsletter, then not only will you be helping with my production costs, but you'll also receive premium newsletters that deliver the kinds of insights you've come to expect from me. If I reach 600 paying subscribers, then I can quit my day job and focus on producing my podcast and newsletter full time. If you'd like to support me and my journalism, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Okay. Now on to my interview with Sean Griffey. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining us. Uh, Thanks for having me on, Simon. So we're here to talk about a media company you founded called Industry Dive. Uh, What were you doing prior to founding it? Well, I've been in uh, business journalism for almost 15 years now with my uh, two co-founders, Ryan Williamson and Eli Dickinson. Uh, Prior to Industry Dive, we were with a company called Fierce Markets that uh, was doing email newsletters uh, all the way back in 2004. Uh huh. And I've, uh, you were kind of like the CEO there, C, and then CEO. I've encountered fierce markets randomly during research, especially back when I was doing work in like telecom and uh, and cable industry type stuff. But I, I have, I've never been like a regular reader. Was that kind of, did that help you in terms of providing a template for what would become Industry Dive? It, it certainly was. Um, it, fierce markets was uh, founded on some of the similar beliefs, which is that you can create compelling editorial products for very niche markets. Uh, As you said, Fierce Wireless uh, was one of the uh, stronger publications in the portfolio and and we're very strong uh, in the, both the telecom and the biopharma spaces uh, back in those times. Um, We we certainly took what we learned there about serving uh, readers and serving advertisers and carried a lot of that over to industry dive uh, when we started this in 2012. And what and how did you get kind of the inkling that you wanted to spin off and start your own thing? Well, I, I think uh, my partners and I are, are entrepreneurial in nature, to be honest. Um, we also saw a hole in the marketplace at the time. I mean, if you if you think back to 2012, it, it uh, doesn't feel that long ago, but it was a time when Facebook was going public and the big knock on them was, could they make money on mobile? Um, they were a strong desktop company, and it wasn't clear that they were going to be able to figure out this mobile problem. When we looked at the landscape, uh, we saw sort of the same dynamics uh, in in business journalism and B2B media, in which uh, case, uh, you know, the iPad came out and people uh, rushed to do one of two things. They, they wanted to recreate magazines and hoped that it would be uh, 1995 all over again. Uh, or they sort of ignored it because they weren't sure how to make money off of it. So we we left and, and launched uh, Industry Dive thinking uh, that a um, you could create really compelling mobile products for uh, business markets. Uh, you could use design as a way to make yourself look bigger uh, and more professional right from the start. Uh, and that um, in these small markets, you could still uh, monetize them uh, using uh, some of the the same advertising and lead generation tactics that have worked, uh, you know, for decades now. Yeah, it's interesting that 2012 12 was a year because, as you kind of mentioned, that was a year where uh, the you know companies start media companies started kind of chasing these 
uh, shiny objects, one being Facebook and and Facebook really opening up the spigot in terms of sending a ton of traffic. I remember I was at a uh, magazine then and from month to month in terms of like our traffic from Facebook, it was just going up like gangbusters. And you could tell that the company was uh, purposefully trying to send traffic to publishers. Uh, and then, like, as you said, the iPad had recently come out and, uh, you know, pe- especially magazine publishers thought they could put the genie back in the bottle and people would start start paying top tier ad rates that they had for print glossies. Uh, but you guys were probably lean. You probably weren't because you were B2B, you weren't really focused on Facebook and I'm guessing you weren't launching as an app. So you were able kind of to avoid some of those pitfalls that really kind of started gaining steam in 2012. Yeah, we we spent a lot of time trying to uh, be very disciplined about our approach and what we're doing. And uh, as you said, avoid the shiny objects. I, I remember having dinner uh, with a CEO of a, of a very large B2B company the day the iPad came out. And he was uh, dismayed that they weren't given early releases to create a tablet version of their magazines. And I sat there and finally said, but how do you know any of your readers or advertisers want a tablet version of your magazine? And it hadn't really dawned on him that maybe they should wait to see what the demand for it was before they they rushed into it. So we've always had a discipline of uh, being fast followers, but also being very core to the things that we think uh, make us successful. Uh, And that's been uh, owning our own audiences, having platforms that we can use to push uh, content instead of relying on pull, uh, pull sort of methods. Uh, And also, you know, uh, collecting real data uh, you know, first party data. And so you mentioned, uh, partners, what was kind of the initial team that, that you had, uh, when you launched in 2012? Well, it was, uh, it, it honestly started with just the, uh, three of us. So, um, Ryan has a a revenue background, uh, and sales background. Eli is our CTO and, and, um, did the whole tech stack here. And, And then I did business and sort of everything else. And for a while, it literally, uh, was the three of us. We were in what was a, a corner grocery store uh, in Adams Morgan part of DC. Interesting. And and w- what about in terms of reporting staff? Like what were the first verticals that you launched? Well, we launched five, which was was really ambitious. Um, wow. And at the, at the time, it was uh, an idea of some original content and then uh, curation and, and aggregation. And we used freelancers. Uh, we wrote some of it ourselves. Uh, and so we were just scrappy sort of bootstrapping. We, we never really raised, you know, any serious sort of venture money. We, we had a little bit of angel uh, friends and family type money, but, but that was it. And so we wrote uh, some ourselves. Um, uh, we used freelancers uh, and we've grown from there. And what, what are some examples of those initial verticals just to give listeners an idea of? Uh, we, we were five. Yeah, we, uh, we launched uh, in the utility space, electric utility. So utility dive was one. Uh, education, uh, focusing on higher education uh, was one. Construction dive, uh, marketing dive, and then waste dive, which is in the solid uh, waste and recycling. So th- those were the five. Early on, it was apparent that utility uh, and education were going to be the, the f- first ones that took off. And so we spent a little bit more time with those in the early days. But but all five of those publications are still part of the portfolio and are doing very well. And how did you grow your audience for these verticals, or especially early on? Yeah, it, it's hard. Um, I think the, the secret of media is finding tar- very targeted audiences in efficient ways. And um, if it was easy and there was a magic bullet, um, everyone would do it. And, and this wouldn't be uh, quite as challenging of an industry. Um, for us, you know, it's uh, you have to be in a, a little bit of channels uh, in a little bit of all the channels. And so we certainly looked for partnerships with events and uh, uh, trade shows uh, and associations. We looked uh, to social channels um, at the time. Twitter was an effective channel. Uh, and that sort of changed, but but LinkedIn groups, um, we uh, fostered a, a whole bunch of LinkedIn groups on niche topics and used those to drive audiences. Um, again, that was something that worked maybe six or seven years ago that doesn't work as well, um, but, but we were all over. Um, at the end of the day, what drives an audience is just good content. And, and even then, uh, as it is today, the number one thing that gets people to sign up for the newsletters and come to the sites is uh, 
you know, shared and, and referrals direct to stories. Yeah, I'm guessing because you guys were so niche, especially with things like utilities and stuff like that, you just don't have the same level of competition in terms of people who are seeking out information, like especially on Google. Like if you're in the politics space now, you're competing with 5,000, you know, other major media companies. But if you're working about, if you're writing about like electrical utilities, there's probably only a very small handful of other publication so you are gonna you're gonna kind of rise to the top quicker i i think you can just in the sheer volume i mean i, I will say this the industries we cover uh, are some of the most dynamic industries uh, in the world that and and most of them touch every person's life somewhere or the other so um we do you know in, in terms of the depth of our coverage uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're competing with other niche publications in the electric utility space, uh, but you, you will also see the Bloomberg's and the Wall Street Journal's uh, of the world uh, report and cover the biggest stories that we do as well. We just do it uh, with a little bit different lens than they do, uh, writing for people who live in and breathe in these markets versus the ones who uh, are interested in it or investors in the space. And it's interesting you bring up LinkedIn groups. I think like some at some point, content marketers just started writing advice articles that any B2B writing or even remotely B2B thought leadership or anything like that, you just need to go join a bunch of groups and then just spam all of them at every single time you publish an article. <laughs> um, is that what you, is that what you think happened kind of eventually? Cause I, I, the, the little bit of dabbling I've done in LinkedIn groups, uh, hasn't been very, uh, very fruitful. Yeah. I will, I will say the, the, you know, and, and for reasons that make sense to them, LinkedIn sort of de-emphasized the groups overall. And, and for group owners, they removed uh, a lot of the tools to moderate the groups. Um, and so that really led to uh, a lot of spam getting in there, which which only fed to the cycle. But I, I agree that there was a time when uh, the groups were really powerful uh, for uh, niche audiences um, and, and for communities, right? There were, there were active communities in the LinkedIn groups, and you see less and less of that today, uh, primarily because how difficult uh, it is to keep them clean and pure. And even LinkedIn, I would, I, would, I would wonder what your LinkedIn traffic is now, because like LinkedIn like, seems like it could have the potential to be the kind of you know, B2B media distribution uh, platform, but I never, like every time I open up, like looking for industry news, like even if when I tried to go follow a bunch of industry publications and stuff on LinkedIn and, and really kind of curate my feed, it's still not really, I'm not, I don't know. It just doesn't seem to play the place that people are going for industry news. I think so though. I will say it, it's a sneaky good, um, platform for us in, in that, um, we get qualified traffic for it. Uh, from it. Um, there's certainly people, it, it's just not coming from the groups. I think it's coming from industry executives sharing to other industry executives and, and we'll see a spike of traffic from there. And so in many ways, it, it, not in many ways, but from a number standpoint, it does much better for us than uh, something like Twitter does, which is where as, as media folks, we spend a lot of time on. It's just not necessarily where our audience is. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the dissatisfaction, you know, overall with LinkedIn is, you know, for for people in the industry and in these communities, you can see how it could be the the greatest B two B publisher uh, in the world, and and yet it it editorially appears to be going more after the Fortune uh, and Forbes crowd than anything else. Yeah, it's very kind of generalized career advice type stuff rather than trying to go deep on any specific uh, niche. Exactly. You you can only have so many Richard Branson uh, advice columns yeah. uh, out there. And so you guys double down on newsletters, though, right, as as being like a huge part of your distribution. Uh, it's always been where we are. I mean, it, it, it's funny to see uh, email newsletters sort of having their renaissance or, or discovery for some people. Uh, as I mentioned, Fierce Markets was, uh, you know, a newsletter company uh, in 2004. And, and it's always been a big part of our strategy for, for some of the reasons I talked about. I mean, it, it is one of the only tools that is personally identifiable uh, in that a unique email address signs up for something. We can then use that email uh, to identify you on devices and tie those devices into a, a single profile. So for media companies that want to create uh, first party data and tie demographics that are supplied by the user with behaviors uh, on devices, email is the, the perfect tool right now to use. So um, for, for that reason, among others, uh, you know, it's always been a key focus for us. What's your philosophy on using newsletters for just like basically to round up headlines to your publication 
and then link to them with a little bit of description versus you're seeing more and more publications launch kind of almost like uh, self like self uh contained newsletters where uh they have a writer and a voice and they're creating original content to kind of incentivize people to have more loyalty for the newsletter and even identify with it yeah well i, I will say this the 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 more you can build your uh, journalist profile uh, and the more the audience connects with them, the, the better personally. So I, I think uh, one of our views has always been how do we uh, make our journalist uh, voices within a community and industry and be inside the industry as opposed to being above it, writing about it. Um, and if you can do that, you have a really powerful uh, publication and, and you see that and you see those people who are really good at it, the Dan Primax uh, of the world and, and others, uh, you see them, you know, bringing audiences with them when they go places. So I think that's the smart piece. Um, how you do that in the, the form of the newsletter via, is it their voice um, front and center and that's all you get versus can they write a piece and then link to articles? Uh, I, I've seen it work well both ways. And, and honestly, we've done it both ways uh, through the course. I think it really depends on the type of content you have and what the, the readership values and, and part of what your uh, promise to them is. Mm -hmm. for, for us, we don't put a lot in the newsletter, um, in part because it goes back to our days, you know, our, our beginnings when we were thinking of mobile. And we were really thinking of how do you uh, make things scannable and fast for people in situations where they don't have uh, much time. And, th and that is sort of the legacy of our publications is we're trying to save you time while, while giving you real insight. And, and then if you click through, you can get much deeper into the content uh, if you care. But if, but if it's a topic or story you don't care about, we don't want to make it hard for you to get to the next piece. Um, so that's our promise and it works for us. But the other ones I think are smart as well. You guys are up to like 19 verticals now. How do you, how do you decide whether to launch a new vertical and what kind of goes into that process? Well, you know, I, I think we, you know, first of all, we, we launch uh, new verticals kind of for the promise of our business, which is, um, you know, we've always believed that that each of these markets just in the digital media space and, and before you start talking about uh, paid research or events or subscription, but for the digital media space, each of these markets can be uh, five to ten million dollars uh, in, in digital revenue uh, at a minimum. And so for us, it was if you want to take that five to 10 million and, and build a really scaled company, you have to do it in multiple ways. And so we've always been built on uh, niche audiences in a platform stand, uh, is stand, uh, uh, standard uh, format so that we can do this in, in multiple times, multiple places. Um, so launching a new verticals is part of our mission. Uh, what we look for when we launch into verticals are, are a couple things. We, we look for business markets that are being disrupted by technology and regulation. We look for uh, industries that have high capital spend. So, so we are an ad supported industry uh, and industries where people buy things. Uh, tend to make them good for advertisers. So I, when I talk about uh, the electric utility is one of the first ones we did. Um, you know, a lot of people dislike their electric utility, but but those guys spend billions of dollars each year to make sure the power goes on and infrastructure and equipment, which leads to a sale uh, for someone like Siemens or General Electric is worth a lot. So the ROI and the CPLs and CPMs they're willing to pay are much higher than uh, they are uh, elsewhere. Um, so, so that's something that we look for. We look for industries where there's big trade shows as a proxy for uh, an audience uh, and a marketplace. Um, so if there's a 50,000 person trade show, all of those people could be readers and all of those exhibitors uh, can be uh, advertisers. And then finally, uh, we look for, you know, ones where there's just not a lot of consolidation. So um, lots of buyers and sellers are good markets for us. Uh, and so when we fit those, we can launch into new ones. And in fact, we launch new publications all the time. And is it like peeling off a writer and say, hey, go experiment with creating some content for this new URL and seeding some content? Or are you going all in where you're hiring, you know, several staff members at once? Like what's the what's what's your approach? Well, that's that's uh, evolved uh, over time um, in the beginning. You know, in the early days when when uh, we were still really small, we didn't have the resources. Uh, it was sort of off the side of our desk. Let's launch one and and 
peel off someone part of their time and write and see how fast we can build an audience. Today, our, you know, I think our audience expects more uh, and our, our advertisers expect more when we launch. Um, and so we do go all in and, and we hire at least two full-time journalists uh, to get the publication off. Um, they'll pull in uh, some help from uh, the existing editorial team, uh, which is up to a little over 70 full-time uh, journalists right now. Uh, to get going, and then we use a freelance budget. So it, we definitely invest a lot heavier than we've done in the past. Um, but there's a demand, you know, an expectation of what the quality of one of our publications is. So, like, are these verticals? Are they like, are they operating in like a semi semi autonomous fashion, or is there like a chief content officer or like editor in chief that's ensuring quality control over the whole thing? Like, how are they operating in conjunction with each other? Yeah, I mean, they they are separate brands um, that that. Uh, published separately. Now, sometimes they will work together on big stories. Uh, whereas, you know, with the coronavirus right now, uh, the retail industry and the supply chain industry, you know, supply chains are are both really impacted. And the writers of our uh, supply chain dive team will team up with the retail dive team to come up with uh, specific content across both. Um, but they do operate at the at the reporter level uh, as independent teams. Um, as you roll up publications, we have managing editors, which will oversee uh, a group of publications. Uh, and then finally, we do have one editor in chief, uh, Davide, Davide Savignier, who uh, oversees the whole whole uh, operation. And like from a marketing standpoint, like does each like team have their own newsletter slash social media type person? Or is that something that you can kind of scale a little bit more by having someone at headquarters doing that? Yeah, it's something that we we try to build uh, shared services across them. Um, so we we use the same templates for the newsletters and the same CMS across them. We have the same you know products that the sales team can sell is identical across them. Uh, the marketing audience development team works across all the publications. It, it really the uniqueness comes down at the journalist level. Um, so we try to do everything the same and use shared services across the whole platform, uh, except when it comes to really knowing. Uh, the content that's going to move the audience, uh, and that's that's with dedicated folks uh, within the the editorial department. And how much content is each vertical pumping out on a daily basis? Like, I, I don't know if you read it, but I did a recent deep dive on like the information and how it only publishes like maybe three or four pieces per day versus like something that's more ad supported, like the TechCrunch that's uh, you know publishing forty articles a day. What, what's kind of your philosophy on a niche vertical and how much content it should be producing. Yeah, we're we're doing, you know, in in we're probably doing three or four uh, a day. Uh, so we publish daily newsletters and there's three to four pieces uh, minimum in each one of those. Uh, so e each uh, each of our publications will have, uh, you know, say three to seven stories a day. Um, sometimes we also have weekly publications in there that are, are very niche topics. Uh, within them. So, so there may be across a given week, another three or four within those, those topics. Um, but when you add up all of the publications, uh, we're, we're creating a couple hundred stories a day among the sev uh, 70 plus journalists and, and freelancers. And how much is like commodity news, kind of like straightforward news stories, kind of AP style versus like in-depth profiles and features and stuff like that? Like what's kind of the bread and butter that, of, of what you think like you guys are doing really well? Well, I, I think it's a it's a mixture of both. I mean, we certainly cover the the breaking news uh, with a focus on adding insight with with what uh, matters for it. So our our journalists spend a lot of time trying to map out the trends that shape an industry, and then we write about the stories that uh, you know fit into those trends and and how uh, or even the ones that don't. But we talk about them against the broad forces that. Are changing industries. Um, so the, there is daily bread and butter news. Uh, we also do and have a tremendous amount of success with doing sort of trackers and, and ongoing looks at stories. So in the waste industry, uh, recycling, the recycling part of the waste industry is undergoing huge upheavals. Uh, and so we will track that story over time and do ongoing uh, pieces with it. Uh, and then we do do deep 
deep dive features uh, on specific topics. And, and there's probably a couple of those a week per publication, maybe two two really big deep dives per week, along with some other uh, other pieces. And uh, like, uh, are there any instances where industry dives reporting bleeds over into the mainstream? Like you mentioned the coronavirus. Is there, are there times when like something within an, uh, a relatively niche industry like really blows up and you're seeing all of a sudden a bunch of kind of normies who who work or live outside that industry or flooding your websites or? Uh, so certainly there are the cases and sometimes you will uh, understand and expect it. And sometimes you have no idea. So we have a construction publication uh, and every now and then we'll, we'll get a tip on a, a stadium construction or we'll break a story. And, and all of a sudden you have uh, 200,000 football fans, uh, you know, looking for pictures of the Raiders new Las Vegas stadium on your site. Uh, so those things happen. We, we tend not to write for those, those folks, but, uh, when you create the content we do every now and then, uh, you'll be surprised when something takes off. And tell me about the recruiting process for journalists and how hard that is. Like, are you guys kind of like a farm team? You see this sometimes with trade publications where they, they keep getting sniped by larger business outlets, like, you know, Bloomberg or CNBC. Is that, how did, how, where do you fit in kind of the, the food chain in terms of recruiting and, and bringing in journalists and having, and protecting them from other publications? Well, I, I don't view it as protecting protecting folks. I mean, it's you know, it's it's our job uh, to create an environment uh, that people can be successful in uh, and that they want to stay. And, and it's our job to make our journalists uh, names in their industry. Uh, and then when they try to get picked off, uh, keep them to stay here. And, and we're not always successful with that. I, you know, if you look at our uh, alumni now, they've been at Politico and The Hill and Business Insider um fortune you know we've, we've lost people to some bigger name publications now that said we've also hired people from uh publications uh like the washington post and uh, usa today and bloomberg uh, as well and and we do well with that i mean i, I think it's a natural progression um it, it certainly is as we've grown as a company uh, they certainly come looking for our journalists more and more. And, and I view that as a good sign uh, that we're doing something right, that people want to hire these folks. Um, and But I do know that when experienced journalists come here, uh, they uh, find it refreshing and they find the growth in our newsroom and the uh, emphasis we place on journalism as a great place to work and they tend to stay. So uh, it's a bit of a mix um, and always a challenge. Are, are you guys doing anything with industry events? Uh, not on our own. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that's something that you'll see us do uh, sooner rather than later. Um, we we certainly, in, in terms of hosting events uh, and producing our own, uh, we don't do uh, many of those. Now, our journalists are certainly out there uh, covering industry events. They certainly go out there and, uh, you know, moderate panels and, and participate in them. But for us right now, um, we're not hosting our own, but, but that'll change sooner rather than later. Why do you think you're slow to do that? Because some, some publications get into that very quickly, especially in the niche, uh, niche verticals. Why do you think that you guys held off? Well, I, I, th I think we're just, we're really good at the digital piece. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the company, uh, has grown, uh, tremendously over 30% each year, um, uh, even this last year and has been, uh, uh, very profitable throughout the whole growth. And so for us, um, you know, I, I think some, uh, publishers go to events because they see that as a way to, to monetize their audiences. Um, we know how to monetize our audiences in ways that we think, uh, are highly profitable and sustainable. And, and we see more opportunities to do that. So when you're a small company, I think the worst thing you can do is be distracted, I think events for some of these companies, when when you go to try to run a large event, the entire company kind of stops and focuses on the event for the six weeks leading up to it, and then takes two weeks to recover coming out. And we just haven't wanted to let let a big event uh, suck the energy of what we're doing, which is growing, you know, our audiences to you know almost nine million. Uh, Northern American executives right now each month. So that's been the focus. What about podcasts? I was interviewing um, the guy who founded Aging Media, which I see is a very similar company to yours. And he was, his teams were really dabbling in podcasts and seeing some good ROI in the, from it in the sense that they could, you know, interview newsmakers on their podcast and then take some of the 
best quotes and stuff and incorporate into articles so they get kind of like double billing on it. Are you guys, uh, you know, doing much with podcasts? We are in, in, in two, two ways. I mean, we host our own. We have a very successful one in the retail uh, space um, that, that doesn't come out regularly, but uh, it, it comes out uh, fairly regularly that, that is very popular. Um, and then we also do uh, sort of bespoke ones on behalf of uh, advertisers out of our brand studio. And that's not through our journalists, but um, we have a content studio that will help uh, clients with them. So uh, it, it's something that we keep growing. Um, there is a, you know, th there is a future in there, uh, both from an audience and a, a marketing standpoint. So um, I like what we're doing. Uh, I like the enthusiasm for audio uh, among the team here. And it's, it's something that um, we're going to keep pushing uh, in, but with some discipline in a moderated way. I, you know, I, I fear in some of the media, uh, podcasting is the next jump that everyone's going to pivot to and throw all their money to and hopes behind. And then they're going to find there's going to be winners and losers in that too. And, and there's going to be a host of folks who uh, have to retool. And so we, we've never wanted to be that media company uh, and we'll, we'll have to figure that balance out. Yeah. I certainly see uh, some companies like throwing a ton of money at like narrative podcasts, which could run well into the six figures just to produce a single season. And they seem to be kind of running ahead of like where the market actually is. Cause like, I think it's you have to get a huge audience and able to, for those to just break even. Um, I'm on the I'm on yep. kind of the record of like like even a low production kind of interview podcast like what we're doing now really is not that expensive to create. It's a lot you know, lower barrier than say video was, um, and that you can get a lot of benefits from it even before you start um, you know monetizing directly just because you can create a more of a connection with your brand. Uh, and your individual reporters and that the, the, because the, you can, because, I mean, think of like the most popular podcast in the world right now is probably Joe Rogan's and his, his production costs are pr probably pretty low. So it's a, there are, there are a lot of benefits to getting in and uh, not that many downsides. I agree. And and you can, you know, as, as you're talking about with aging media folks, you can repurpose the content in multiple ways. And I think anytime, uh, it, it becomes uh, a conversation you can have, your, your journalists can have with senior executives um, and you can get them for an hour. You can get real insights that other people haven't gotten, yeah. right? So it's a, it's an hour interview um, with some of the most important people of your, uh, in your industries. And that's great for your audience, but it also builds relationships with those folks that you can then uh, take over to when you have a story you're working on and, and you need uh, their insights to help you with it. From a reporter standpoint, I think these podcasts serve so many different uses. Yeah, and also like it, it can, you can hit your audience in times where they're unreachable, like during their commutes or when they're going on a walk or when they're cleaning their house or whatever. These, this, this is this is previously media time that we're uh, or not non media time because you couldn't reach uh, consumers at all. But now it gives you like one more extension to to reach them. It seems like exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about money. Like, what is your monetization strategy? Like, you guys are steering at least seems to be steering clear of subscriptions and have gone all in on advertising, right? Uh, we have, we have. So, um, you know, as I said in the the part, like I, th there's still real dollars when when the audience is valuable, uh, and I think the media's biggest mistake was um, they viewed scale as let's let's do something that's only marginally valuable, but try to do it a lot and see if it becomes highly valuable. And um, for us, scale is always meant let's do something that's highly valuable in a repeatable way. And so in our markets, these audiences, uh, you know, being able to connect with them in authentic ways about uh, topics, relevant topics and context of what's going on with a trusted brand behind you, it still works. Uh, and it works from a thought leadership. Uh, our, our content studio, the, the brand studio is growing uh, leaps and bounds. Um, it's the fastest growing part of our, our company. Um, but but then there's just pure lead generation, which works really well in a digital format. And if you have uh, advertising base that wants lead generation for high value products, you can still monetize this. And is lead generation, is that e-commerce? Is that like, what what does that mean by lead generation? Well, I mean, for us, you know, it's, it's not e-commerce. So if, if you think about uh, and I, I keep using the utility space, but so we'll, we'll continue with that example. You know, the, the purchasing decisions in some of those could take years. 
Um, but the purchasing decision could also be uh, a 50 to $80 million buying decision. Um, so it's not an e-commerce play where you're looking to, uh, you know, um, s sell this watch to someone eventually or, or a pair of jeans um, to them. We are helping these people identify the right buyers within their markets. We're helping get their uh, message to them. And, and then we're helping the marketers get permission to have conversations with them. And, and it's literally that where, where our audience will, you know, fill out landing page forms that say, I want this information and I'm OK with or, or even want uh, the advertiser to contact me. It, you know, the information is valuable enough. And, and when you're, um, you know, I think we have a, a view of ads as being disruptive and annoying. But when the ads are solving problems that you have at work every day. Um, you're interested in them and, and it works. So mm -hmm. um, that's what we've so, been doing and, and paid off. So what does that look like? Like, are you creating like a PDF white paper for a client? It's putting it behind an email gate where they have to fill in all this information and then sending and then, you know, including a link in your newsletter that's saying, hey, download this white paper or like how how does that work in practice? I, I mean, that th there's certainly some of that. Um, there, there are certainly... Uh, you know, uh, sponsored stories and content syndication. Um, as I mentioned, we will do podcasts for people or we will do uh, high end surveys of our audience about the state of the industry sponsored by someone where we'll, we'll then deep dive uh, across um, across specific topics that, that relate uh, both to the things that are shaping the industry, but also things that they work. So, um, you know, the great thing about digital is you're not limited to one format. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, the uh, playbooks and white papers and those types of things uh, have, you know, worked and provide value and, and we do do them. And you're doing almost all direct sales, like not, not much in programmatic advertising. Uh, we have zero programmatic. Uh, I think, you know, 80 some percent of our sales, uh, 85, 90 percent of our sales go directly through uh, marketers within the companies. Every now and then we'll go through uh, an ad agency. Um, but but by and large, where we're most successful is when we can be consultative uh, with the client, really understand the audiences they're trying to reach, uh, what what their goals are in the campaign, and then help design something that works for them and and works for our audience. How big is your ad sales team? Are they are they selling across verticals, or you have like you know niche specific ads or ad sales? Yeah, so you know we have about twenty five people in the in the advertising department of which I think 18 or so are doing direct sales right now. Um, our, our sales territories are, are broken down by buyer type. Um, so often that means that, uh, you know, their, their buyers, a sales, a sales team buyers will are only interested in one, one of our verticals. Um, but sometimes they go across them and, you know, if, if someone is selling, uh, you know, an e-commerce solution, they may want to reach uh, advertisers in, in retail dive. They may want to reach or, or readers in retail dive. I'm sorry. Um, they may want to reach people in the food and grocery uh, dive or marketing dive and the rest. So our, our sales team can sell across the product portfolio. Um, but in practice, they generally sell into one or two publications. And are they doing a lot of cold calls or are you guys so influential in your verticals that like advertisers are just calling you up and begging to advertise? <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, it, it, it would be fun if uh, we were turning away uh, advertisers, but but we, you know, we go out and get the get the brand, you know, name out. Um, some of our publications are brand new. So it's, uh, you know, people we're still building brands like we last year we launched into uh, the banking industry and, and we've got a long way to go to be a household name in the banking industry. But um, we're getting there every day and the audience keeps growing. Uh, but that sales rep is calling folks and uh, going to trade shows and, and meeting them there and, and explaining the value uh, that we can provide. And the last time you were openly talking about revenue, which was as of a few years ago, you were generating somewhere north of, I think, $22 million and you were profitable. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, that's where we were uh, two years ago. And, and as, as I've said, we've, we've been growing every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, what so you so you took you, you got like a major influx of money and investment from a private equity firm. Yep. So we partnered with a private equity firm called Falfurious Capital uh, out of North Carolina uh, right around Labor Day of last year. 
Uh, so you're gro- you're growing great. You're you're bootstrapping. What made you decide you to take on private equity? You know, I I I think at the end of the day, I mean, the most simple way to say it is uh, the business deserved more. Um, we uh, we've been growing really well. Uh, we've been on a path, but we've really uh, built a loyal audience, and we've had a roadmap for doing other things. Which you know we talked about includes events. It includes uh, some of the subscriptions and and paid research and membership models. And what we realized is is doing that on our own um, was just going to be too slow uh, for what we wanted to do. And and a partner, Fal Furious. Um, they came and, and the first conversation we had is they led with journalism and they talked about the importance of content, which is what we've said here uh, all along. And, and one of the things that it particularly in the uh, business media, B2B media, I feel has been neglected. Um, but when they came and said, hey, we have resources to help accelerate this. We believe in what you're doing and what's going to lead all of this is content. Um, we thought this may be the right partner for us. And, and the more diligence we did and the, the more uh, conversations we had, the more convinced we were that that was uh, the right answer for us. And, and it's been a fantastic uh, first six months. And so obviously it's a little bit uh, early to really say too much, but uh, like what is then on the product roadmap that you think you're going to be able to accomplish that you that you wouldn't have otherwise? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. We're, we're actively looking at acquisitions, to be honest. Um, and uh, there are, are companies uh, in the event space um, that I think would be very good fits here that uh, have capabilities of events um, that we could then apply to our audiences and our industries. Um, you know, uh, event companies advertise quite heavily with us right now, and, and we've seen startup events be built uh, leveraging our audience as much as anything. And, and I think it's time uh, for us to start thinking about that. And so events are one. Um, we are experimenting internally with uh, some paid products, uh, you know, which will be sort of a, a subscription sort of research piece that we might do in one or two of our industries. Uh, but I certainly think that um, they will provide capital to help do that either uh, internally, or we will uh, partner with someone who's done it already. And, and again, I'm, I'm looking for either building something here or, uh, you know, finding companies that have capabilities we can apply to our audiences. Well, when you're ready to extend to the business of content, just make sure to give me a call. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Excellent. So uh, did, I, have you read this first Ben Smith column, his first medium column at the New York Times or seen people talking I've, about it? I've seen, I've seen the talk about it. I have to admit that I didn't read the whole thing. Uh, so his thesis is kind of, and it was kind of, as people were pointing out, mainly just a way for him to humble brag about how dominant uh, the New York Times is. But it was kind of, is the New York Times crowding out all other journalism, sucking up all its talent, all its potential subscribers, revenue, audience, yada, yada, yada. I wrote a co- I wrote a newsletter, I think yesterday, kind of like making the point that like, yeah, there's pro- it's probably the end of time, the, the days when we're going to see these big general interest publications, but there's so much happening in the niches that, uh, the, you know, kind of like what you guys are doing, what I'm doing, what you're seeing, all these sub stacks and podcasts is doing where uh, like the New York Times just can't go that deep uh, and that there's a lot of there's still a ton of opportunity there, I think. I, I agree. You know, I, I think um, th- these publications could do really, you know, do a really good job at what they do and they can cover a individual story really, really well. But we have teams of people who are following things on a daily basis with incredible depth and passion who are at each of these shows talking to people on the ground. Uh, and that's something, you know, even for the most successful uh, media companies, generalist media companies, that's really difficult to do. Uh, yeah. And I think there's always going to be a role for people like us who want to cover something uh, with depth and passion. Uh, and, you know, the the tools that we have now and the, the ways to reach audiences are only going to make us more successful. And I, I really believe that. It, it may make it hard for people to be, you know, billion dollar companies, but I think there's there's going to be hundred million dollar companies, two hundred million dollar companies uh, all over the place um, that can do this. Yeah, like even if like for instance, if the New York Times hires a couple of retail reporters, which I'm sure they have, they're 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 constantly going to be held back by having to explain to a like basically broaden their coverage for for a general audience. Whereas 
uh, you you have the freedom to like go really deep into these crevices that they could never really go into. Exactly, and and we can tie a, a story to a different company that did did something similar three years ago, four years ago, right? That that piece is almost never going to be part of uh, the you know generalist Wall Street Journal story of of a business piece, um, but it will be part of ours when when we can go back and tie to an FDA's decision eight years ago and what that did in a similar a similar piece. That's what our audience knows about and cares about and they want us to talk about. Uh, and that's just different than than what, a, you know, your mom and dad would want to read about this story. Okay, Sean. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Uh, I personally am on Twitter. Um, they can uh, find all of Industry Dive's publications uh, at industrydive.com. And, and thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Simon. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay. See you next week.